Hello, everybody. My name is Diane Olivo Posner, and I am the principal librarian for the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, today's program, uh, LA Made, is going to be on uh, learning about the bonsai. But before I get started, I wanted you to know about the LA Made series, which is uh, sponsored by the National Endowment to, for the Humanities. And also, I wanted to give a big thank you to our Los, uh, Los Angeles Public Library Foundation, who helps us manage um, the funds for the LA Made series. I also wanted to thank our behind the scenes staff who helped bring these programs to you virtually. And I wanted to let you know about next week's program. So next Thursday, July 30th at four o'clock, we will be having Lily Padilla, a certified nutrition health uh, coach. And she will be teaching us the benefits of nutritional cooking and eating for healthy digestion and proper assimilation of nutrients to help boost our immunity and energy. And I wanna, there's a big note that this program will be presented in Spanish. So la semana que viene vamos a tener un programa totalmente en español con Lili Padilla y ella va a hablar sobre la, la nutrición y la salud. La, eh, es el 30 de, de uh, julio, la, en la semana que viene, a las 4 también. So now I would like to introduce Robert Pressler, who is the president of the California Bonsai Society. Today, he will be, we will learn about the history of the bonsai tree, and Robert will give us expert guidance on trimming, wiring, and shaping, as well as how to transplant into a bonsai pot. So without further ado, Robert Bressler and the bonsai tree. My name is Bob Pressler. Um, um, like she said, I'm the uh, president of the California Bonsai Society, and I own Kimura Bonsai Nursery in Northridge. What we're going to do, there's so much in bonsai. We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks talking about this and not even touch the surface of it. So I'm going to kind of go through a whole bunch of stuff, give you a bunch of information, and take a little tree and show you how to shape it. This morning... The tree that we're going to work on this afternoon looked like this. It was this big bush from a nursery. And as you can see, I think inside there's a lot of dead stuff and all kinds of stuff that need to be cleaned up and big branches that we can't use. So I spent a little time this morning because that's boring to watch. And I cleaned up that stuff, I took out the dead stuff, I took out the branches we don't use. And this is what remains. And this is what will turn into a bonsai um as we go along okay bonsai can be a lot of different things to a lot of people um as simple as those little 9.99 you know bonsai kits which you should run away from if everybody ever offers you one to you know nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollar trees that are sold in japan um and everything in between you see people on the side of the road selling them out of their trucks you see specific bonsai nurseries um, you see them at Home Depot, all kinds of stuff. So there's a place in bonsai for everybody and everything. Some people, it's a real art form, and they take it very seriously, and it's you know considered high art. Other people, it's a hobby, and it's a way that they kind of like chill out and relax. Um, for other people, it's just kind of a cool horticultural thing, you know, keeping a little tree alive in a little pot. Um, for me, it's a little bit of all of that plus business, <clears throat> but, um, one thing I need to stress about bonsai is that it's a living tree. It's alive. So whatever we do to it, which sometimes is pretty stressful, the tree needs to be able to withstand that. So it has to be healthy. So you never want to do stressful techniques to a healthy tree. We'll be bending and twisting this thing and wrapping it in wire and doing all kinds of stuff. Um, but this is a nice healthy juniper. You can tell by the way these new tips are extending out. 
This is a um, juniper chinensis or uh, Shampaku juniper. Very common juniper used uh, for bonsai in Japan and in this country. Not used for much else in this country other than bonsai. So what I did this morning was I cleaned out all the dead stuff. This tree is probably about seven years old from a cutting. We took a cutting about this big and it grew roots and planted it and let it grow. And um, a key thing to bonsai is proportion. So, you know, it's got this base that's this big and the tree was like, I don't know, three feet tall. So, and the branches were too thick. Nothing looked in proportion. So I cut off the big heavy branches. You can see right here, I cut off a couple branches that were coming off here. And then there was a really big branch right here that kind of wrapped around and went around the back of the tree, which was kind of weird and left myself with this stuff. So, um, I'm going to try to figure out how to make this into a bonsai. While I'm looking at the tree and figuring out what I'm going to do, um, I will talk a little bit about the history of bonsai, which um, most people think of as being Japanese. And for the most part, what we practice in this country is based on Japanese ideas and techniques, but kind of Americanized, mostly by virtue of the fact that um, – we don't put nearly the time and detail into it as the Japanese typically do. Um, but, you know, that's kind of not our uh, national way. But um, so we've taken, you know, a lot of their tips or tricks and techniques and kind of Americanized them and made it work for us. We also do a lot of work with a lot of uh, trees that um, – are available in Japan. Like one of the best trees I think for bonsai are our own native California junipers. They're awesome. Some of these trees are hundreds of years old. They've got all kinds of deadwood on the trunk and you know, they just look like something that has gone through hundreds of years of living in the Mojave desert. Um, and they make great bonsai. Luckily they don't grow in Japan or else uh, a lot of them would be there. So like a lot of things in Japan, Bonsai originally came from China, and originally nobody really knows where it came from. Probably started with healers using um, pots to grow herbs and, and uh, other vegetables and, and plants that they used for their healing purposes. And from that led to kind of a more artistic uh, way. But... Um, it came from China to Japan with the, with the Buddhist monks that also brought Zen Buddhism and stuff like that to Japan. And the Japanese took that and really kind of transformed it into their own art form. Um, and it's definitely high, high art. Uh, there's some incredible trees in Japan that would just take your breath away. And some of these trees are hundreds of years old. Uh, the first bonsai tree I ever saw, I was 10 years old, and I got dragged to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in New York. And um, I saw this little tree that was about the size of this tree right here. And the sign said that it was a 250-year-old Sergeant Juniper from Japan. And that just blew me away. I couldn't believe that something could be that small and that old. And... That's what we're trying to do when we make bonsai. Sometimes we actually use old trees. We'll get trees, you know, out of the mountains or desert um, that could possibly be hundreds of years old and use them. But a lot of times we use, the most common thing we do is use nursery stock like we're using here today. And this is just, you know, a juniper grown in bonsai nursery. Nothing really special about it. <clears throat> but what we try to do is create the, the illusion of an old ancient tree and typically for junipers anyhow, because um, juniper wood is really, really hard and lasts a really long time. So it lends itself to having dead wood features, which kind of um, do several things. First of all, it, it instantly adds age and drama to a tree to have some dead wood on it. Um, it it helps us disguise a lot of our own work. It's a way to um, 
you know, make the tree look much, much older. So what I'm doing right here is I took, I cut this branch off this morning and I took the bark off of that part that I cut off. And that's called a gin, this dead branch right here. This, this piece right here, this is called a gin. Any dead branch that's left on a tree, we call it a gin, J-I-N. And then if there's dead wood that goes down onto the trunk, like this little bit where is it? right here, that is called shari. So our, our deadwood, main two deadwood features are called gin and shari. So, and, uh, you know, like I said, one of the reasons we do this is to add instant drama to a tree. It automatically makes the tree look like it's, you know, been through some natural phenomenon that made it break or maybe it got struck by lightning and parts of it died off. So, and when the branch is live, like this was this morning, the bark comes off really easy. When the branch is dead, like this branch down here was, um, the bark does not come off so easy. So we're going to use these, this little guy right here and this guy right here as features of the tree. Um, so bonsai, the word bonsai literally means tree in a tray. So... But it goes way beyond that. Um, you know, technically, I guess if you take any pot or shallow pot and put a tree in it, it's a bonsai. But um, that's just the beginning. You know, um, what I try to do is to find what I think is the best um, representation of the spirit of a tree that this piece of material or any piece of material will give me. And what I see in this guy is, um, you know, I like these pieces here that have dead wood and when we do a little bit more work on them and tear this so it doesn't look so cut off, it'll look much more natural. Um, we've got a little bit more of it up here. So it gives me opportunities to create gins and anywhere there's a gin, the part of the trunk right below that dead branch will naturally die back. So we can also create a little bit of a shari. And having those gins and sharis will add some drama to the tree. And I like to, if you can see what I'm doing here, take this and twist it and pull it down and kind of rip the, the bark and the, um, the pieces of wood out because it looks much more natural than cut. So I'm going to create a little bit more shari here on the trunk. Now, when you're doing this with a tree like this, um, you want to work on the deadwood stuff first, and then you style the tree. So you kind of have to have a, a vision in your head, at least somewhat, of what you want the tree to look like to begin with. And I do. Um, I think this tree will be much less than eight inches tall. It'll probably have um, a significant amount of deadwood on it and um, be of a slanted or semi-cascade style. Um, and by that, I mean the, the inclination of the trunk and the style of the tree, there's several versions. We have one like that if the tree was standing up like this, and the top of the tree came over the side, that would be called an informal upright. A formal upright, which I can't show you at this tree, would be a tree that is just perfectly straight up and down, like a redwood, where the trunk is completely straight. Um, there's a full cascade where the branch of the tree goes down below the pot, like a tree hanging off of a cliff. There's also a half cascade or semi-cascade. Um, which is probably what we'll do today with this tree. There's a, a forest style where you can plant multiple trees in groups and represent forest. I actually planted a forest one time that was a little bit longer, eight feet long, and had 110 trees in it. 
and the tallest tree was three feet tall and the shortest tree was about eight inches tall. It was pretty cool. Um, so, so what I'm doing first is I'm doing a little bit of work in the deadwood and I'm kind of creating these gins and tearing off the pieces that were cut, make them look a little bit less like uh, they were man-made. Um, ideally, when we're done, and by done, that's kind of a relative thing. What we're going to do today is set the basic framework and the foundation for this tree. Um, you know, bonsais take years and years and years to develop a good one, which is one of the reasons why some of them get so expensive. You see this branch? It looks like it was just cut off, this guy right here. Well, if I take my pliers and grab a piece of it and pull down a little bit and kind of tear it, I have to do it facing it. It makes it look much more natural and less cut and more like it was broken by the force of nature. I don't know if you can see the detail in that, but it, it's not flat and cut off anymore. So if anybody has any questions, um, please go ahead and make comments. I'll answer them as we go along as best I can. Ah, oh, I guess if I click on the comments, I'll see them. I think he can. Okay, um, so for bonsai, we use a lot of different trees. There's more trees we can use than that aren't. One thing I uh, caution people is to use trees that will grow in your area. You know, if you live in the Palmdale, Lancaster area, you probably don't want to grow Japanese maples. If you live in Malibu or one of the beach cities, um, maybe you can. But typically, maples aren't very happy with most Southern California weather. Um, but there's, you know, pines and junipers and olives and bougainvilleas and pyracanthas and elms and trident maples and Japanese maples and several different kinds of elms and oaks and boxwood and a whole plethora of trees that we can use. Um, so we're really lucky, especially here in Southern California. We have a huge growing season. We can basically work on trees year round. There are some restrictions. Um, in the intro, it said that I was going to talk about, uh, well, I will talk about it, but I will not show you how to repot and transplant into a bonsai pot. That's one of the things that really is key to be done at the proper time. You're cutting, when you go from a pot that's this big, this is a two gallon size pot. So it's probably, I think, 10 inches across and 10 inches tall. And eventually, this tree is going to go to a bonsai pot that's about this big around, so maybe five inches by an inch or an inch and a half tall and four inches wide or so. So we're going to go from this much root to this much root, and we can't do that all at one time. And you can't do it in this time of year um, on this type of tree. So today what we're going to do is set the initial style, kind of come up with the, the basic form of the tree and set all the basic branches and create a bunch of deadwood and stuff. Um, and then next March, I'll reduce the roots and probably put it into an oversized bonsai pot to let the branches grow and develop. And I'll do some trimming and maybe some more fine wiring and let the tree kind of develop that way. So um, somebody wants to know, does the tree thrive indoors? Bonsai do not thrive indoors. There are some tropical type trees like ficuses that you can grow indoors, uh, but even those without lots of um, extra lighting and humidity and, and lots of extra care don't really thrive all that well. They, they're trees, they really need to be outside. Most typical bonsais, like junipers, cannot live indoors. They can come inside for you know, a little bit of time, a day, a weekend, if you're having a party and want to show off your tree or something, that's cool. But they have to live outside. 
Um, and, you know, that's one of the things we get the most in the nursery. People will come in and they want a tree to give to somebody to put in their office or their dorm room or something. And, um, you know, other than a ficus and people don't really, a lot of people don't like the ficus because they're not traditional bonsai. Um, but, you know, I've seen some pretty awesome ficus bonsai, but um, even those I would not grow indoors personally. I would grow them outside, especially here in Southern California. Um, there's very few areas where you need to worry about a frost. So there's no reason to grow them indoors unless you have no place to grow them outside. You know, if you live in an apartment and you don't have an outdoor area, then maybe you don't have much of a choice. So when we're shaping trees, um, what I'm doing right now is kind of just cutting off little stuff that um, I know we're not going to use branches that are hanging from the bottom of a branch because that kind of disturbs the line of the tree. Um, that's a real key thing to creating the negative space in a bonsai and negative space is really important. Um, and it also helps with proportion and stuff like that. So basically I think what our tree is going to be, It's, I'm either going to use this side here and make something out of this that will be kind of slanted off in that direction. Or I'm going to use this side and make something out of this. And then the other side will become dead wood. So one side I'm going to use to kind of form my tree. And the other side I'm going to create a lot of dead wood out of it. So I need to make that decision. And this is... Um, Sometimes it's difficult is finding the tree within the tree um, because it's never just what you see. Uh, you know, so sometimes you really have to search for it. So, and what I look for when I'm doing that is number one, I look at the base here. I don't know if you can see this very well with the soil and stuff, but typically I want to find the widest part of the base, the part that looks most stable. And I think of that as the front of my tree initially. And then I look from there and I look at other stuff and see what other features there are and whether that section of the front highlights those features or not. And for here, this doesn't. So I want the, I want to highlight this deadwood, this big gin here on the side and this little shari in the trunk. I want those to be important parts of the tree. So our front's going to be someplace on this side where we can really see that stuff. I'm just going to make this shari a little bit bigger. So this is safe to do because um, the branch that I cut, what was feeding that branch from the roots going up to that branch is what's right under the branch. So by making this shari directly underneath the branch here, the branch is no longer demanding the sap that was flowing there. So it's not going to affect the rest of the tree this sap will stop flowing and it'll just go around it and go up to the rest of the tree that's alive. Um, and eventually it'll form little ridges here where I took the bark away. They'll roll over and it'll have some scar tissue there and um, start to look old and more natural. So I think what we're going to do is the front of the tree is going to be in here someplace. I'm probably going to tip it a little bit and I'm going to use this part here to make our tree. And the reason being is because there's this cool movement in the front. We got this deadwood here. And then this comes up and makes a movement and a movement. So there's a lot of cool movement built right into the trunk. Um, so I want to take advantage of that stuff. So that means that this side is going to be mostly deadwood. And um, a lot of times when I'm doing this initial styling, I'll leave more deadwood than I know for sure I'm going to use just because um, if you cut it off, it's gone. You can't glue it back. Well, you can if it's dead, but, um, you know, it's otherwise it's gone. So um, I'll always leave extra and you can always cut it off later. Sometimes, you know, it's too much. Sometimes it's not. Um, but like I said, you can always reduce it later. So, Having made this decision, now I can work quickly on this side. And I'm going to create some dead wood here. 
right, Shari is this dead area on the trunk. You see where the bark is peeled away underneath this branch? I cut this branch this morning, and then uh, I peeled the bark off of the branch, and then I also continued peeling the bark down the trunk. So if it's dead wood on the trunk, it's called shari. If it's a dead branch, like this little branch stub right here, that's called a gin. Yes, this is a, a high penny. This is a, a shimpaku juniper. It's um, shimpaku juniper on its own roots, actually, not grafted. Very often, for those that don't know, um, very often uh, with junipers, we have a tree that has really cool trunk and interesting movement, but the foliage isn't that interesting. So we can actually change the foliage. We can take a more desirable foliage, one that has better characteristics for bonsai, and graft it onto another tree. And we call that kind of changing its clothes. Um, some people do that quite often with California junipers. California junipers um, tend to have fairly coarse foliage and more fine, refined foliage is sometimes preferred. Personally, you know, if a tree has a lot of deadwood on it and stuff, I don't want to have real fine shimpaku foliage on it. I like its native foliage for the most part. But it is something that, that can do. So a lot of people will take, you know, an old collected juniper that has, you know, a gnarly trunk and all kinds of cool deadwood and stuff, and then change the foliage so that the foliage is, um, you know, something that they find more desirable. Personally, I'm not a fan, but uh, that's just me. Lots of people do it. So what I'm doing is kind of trying to get things a little bit into proportion now. Proportion is key to making a bonsai look like a real tree. If you get the proportions right, it doesn't really matter if your tree is four inches tall or four feet tall. If there's nothing next to it to show scale, People won't be able to tell what size it is. They won't be able to tell, you know, how big it is. It'll, it'll look like a real tree. So mostly what I'm doing right now is cleaning up the bottoms of these branches. Like I said earlier, um, the bot having the bottoms nice and clean and flat like this really helps you define the negative space. And that's an important feature. So um, typically, this year is um, obviously a little bit strange, uh, I'm sure, for everybody. But typically, in Southern California, we have a bunch of bonsai clubs. There are, let's see, just in Los Angeles, we have the California Bonsai Society, which is the oldest bonsai club in the country. And um, we're not quite a typical club. We only meet four times a year. But what we do when we meet is we bring in a renowned international artist from wherever. Uh, we've had people from Japan, from England, um, from Puerto Rico, from Greece, uh, from New Jersey, <laughs> all kinds of foreign countries. Um, but yeah, these are fairly renowned artists and we bring them here and for a week we share these artists with other local clubs. The third week of the month there are six I believe bonsai clubs that meet or five bonsai clubs that meet in one week. So it j just works out really well. Each club, you know, these clubs could not on their own afford to bring in some of these masters and pay their airfare and room and board and all that stuff. But we can. So we bring these people in, and then the clubs get to have them be their demonstrator and do you know demonstrations and workshops for them while they're here. So um, you know, we're kind of trying to be a resource for the bonsai community. Another thing we do is we just gave it out in June, is we have what we call the Ben Oki Scholarship Fund. Ben Oki was a... Um, one of the original old time bonsai guys in California way back when who um, was kind of like John Naka, who is to bonsai in America what Frank Lloyd Wright was to architecture. Uh, John's considered the godfather of American bonsai. 
and Ben was kind of his right hand man. And John traveled the world teaching bonsai. Look at that, just peeling the bark off of that, leaving that dead wood like that, kind of already starting to make this tree look like not at all like a nursery plant and something that, you know, maybe was kind of growing out in the mountains or something. So, you know, going from this to this, just with a few snips, we haven't even gotten to the wire yet. So um, the Ben Oki Scholarship Fund was something that I got started when I took over as president to honor Ben. Ben had just passed away um, pretty much just as I took over. My first official function as president of the California Bonsai Society was to go to Ben's funeral. Um, so I, we started this scholarship fund for people to study bonsai. And initially we started it out, we were giving out $200. We gave out five $200 scholarships a year to people from anywhere in the country or actually anywhere that could cash a check from an American bank um, to study bonsai. And we did that for a few years. And last year we had an opportunity. We had a tree donated to us that was originally collected in style by Ben Oki. Uh, it was a California juniper. Uh, it was an amazing tree. It had this huge swath of dead wood and um, just, you know, beautiful tree. It wound up being a beautiful tree. When we got it, it was kind of um, a little bit neglected and old and not so stable in the pot and stuff. And I took the tree up to Ryan Neal, who is probably one of the best known bonsai artist in the country. He studied in Japan for seven years and, you know, is a bonsai master in his own right. And Ryan back in the days, you know, was a student of Ben's and Ben was kind of partially responsible for Ryan being able to go to Japan and study. So I knew Ryan had um, a special um, relationship with Ben. And, you know, like I said, Ryan's one of the most famous bonsai artists in the country. And this tree was donated to us with the idea that we would auction it off and use that money to fund the scholarship program. So I went to Ryan and Ryan was like, yes, um, I'll love to do it. You know, let's uh, let's really do it, do it upright. So Ryan has um, a whole crew of tech people and has a very strong online presence. And he did made a little documentary about Ben and um, about styling the tree and stuff. He planted the tree into a pot made by Sarah Rayner, who is um, one of the iconic American bonsai potters. And um, we auctioned this tree off and the tree sold for $16,000, which went into our scholarship fund. Um, so, by virtue of that, we were able to change the scholarships that we were offering to from five $200 scholarships to two $1,000 scholarships this year for the first time. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to do that. $1,000 is a good amount of money to somebody to devote to um, learning bonsai. Okay, so what we're gonna do is now I got to do something with this mess here. I'm going to put some wire on this because I'm going to want to move this branch around. I'm going to want to move all these branches around, but I want to move this big branch. And I also want to move this gin. I don't want this going. If the rest of the tree is going this way, I don't kind of want this going off in the opposite direction. It just makes your eyes go like this. So we kind of have to move both of these. So that's going to take a fairly significant piece of wire. All right, wiring bonsai. Um, there are some people that swear you only use copper wire on junipers. There are others that, you know, use aluminum. Um, personally, I use, I use aluminum because we go through a lot of wire here and I'm cheap. Copper wire is really expensive and to use it for bonsai, it needs to be annealed. So, um, you know, you can't just go buy a chunk of copper wire and use it. It needs to be baked until it's uh, completely red hot, completely throughout, and then cooled off, and that softens it. And then as you use it and put wire bends in it, it stiffens up. It's much stronger than aluminum wire. Uh, it holds a lot better. And if uh, 
it wasn't so expensive. I would use copper wire all the time, but it is so I don't. I use aluminum. So this is um, four gauge uh, aluminum wire, and I don't think it's going to actually be big enough. I'm going to use one a little bit bigger. That gin's kind of stiff, and I really want to move it. So I'm going to use a number five aluminum wire, and I'm going to wire, place it on the tree. I'm holding it nice and snug to the tree, and I'm going to make one good turn around the trunk here. Try not to get my foliage in there. Get a good turn around the trunk there just to get it started. And then I can come up onto this guy and bring the wire around here. I'm bending the wire in kind of a 40-ish degree angle, bringing it around the trunk. Um, this big wire sometimes gets stiff, so when you get out towards the ends, it's much easier to use a pair of pliers to wire. But using the wire allows us to... Uh, for the most part, move branches where we want them to a certain extent. Um, yeah, there's some things that are just too big to bend. Or there are other things that you can make really big bends if you take the time and do it correctly. You need to kind of wrap the, the branch that's being bent with something like raffia or tape or something to protect it from breaking. Um, and slowly over time make a bend but i've bent stuff as big as a baseball bat um first time you do it it's a little bit hairy but after a while you get used to it but um you know bonsai is bonsai is kind of a strange thing because it's an art but it's also a hobby it's also a craft um and for some people it's a way of life it's, uh, you know, um, some people, it's, it's how they commune with nature is with bonsai trees. Um, for other people, it's, uh, their artistic way of expressing themselves. And they can, um, you know, take a plant and turn it into a piece of art. So let's see how much I can bend this guy down. So, so not only do I have to bend the wire, I have to bend the branch without breaking it. And I don't know if you can see, I probably should have showed you the branch first. This branch was pretty straight. You see how it's now getting this curve in it? And I've also pulled it down considerably. So, so um, anyhow, I was talking about the clubs and stuff here. So we've got California Bonsai Society, um, Bicoan meets at the LA Arboretum, I believe on the uh, third Tuesday of each month when the Arboretum's open for meetings. Um, Daiichi Bonsai Club meets in Gardena at the Ken Nakaoka Community Center on the third Friday of each month. There's um, uh, Sensui Kai, which meets in Encino on the third Wednesday of each month. There's a uh, Descanso Bonsai Society that meets on the third Tuesday. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Descanso meets on Tuesday and um, Bico Inn at the Arboretum is on Thursday. So uh, Descanso is at Descanso Gardens. And then down in Anaheim, on that third Saturday night of each month, there's Kofu Kai Bonsai. And that doesn't count. There's some um, Korean Bonsai Associations and some Vietnamese Bonsai Associations and uh, a couple Chinese Bonsai Associations. So there's a lot of organized bonsai in Southern California. And we're really lucky. I mean, not only is there a lot of bonsai here, there are a lot of bonsai teachers. There are a lot of um, 
materials and sources for materials for bonsai and a lot of bonsai knowledge um you know for when after world war ii when bonsai really started to take off in this country um it was because of guys that were in the internment camps um you know those guys are the ones that brought bonsai basically to the american public and you know when you think about it it's kind of amazing that you know going through what they went through and they still were willing to share what, um, for a lot of them, is a really deep, meaningful part of themselves. Um, you know, bonsai meant a lot to a lot of these guys. But, you know, they're because it's something that they love so much, they wanted to share it. And, um, you know, so we got all those clubs here. We've got a lot of bonsai history here. Some of, uh, I mentioned John Naka. John was, uh, you know, kind of known as the godfather of American bonsai. And, um, you know, there was Ben Oki, his secondhand guy, and then there's a whole slew of other guys that were, for the longest time, really kind of cutting edge in American bonsai. And, you know, these guys were the first ones to start traveling around the country and eventually around the world to um, this branch. I'm going to move pretty significantly up and around so it's facing the other way. Um, yeah, these guys were the first ones to start taking bonsai to other places and um, sharing their, their love and their knowledge with people. And around the world, I mean, John literally has been to, you know, South America, North America, Asia, Africa, um, I don't know if John made it to Australia or not, but I know other people have. Uh, just, you know, all over the place, sharing his love for bonsai. If it wasn't for John Naka, um, bonsai wouldn't be what it is today anywhere in the world. I mean, not just here, but, uh, you know, he was revered even in Japan. Okay, so we're getting there. Um, we get the gin kind of moving this way. I'm going to put a piece of wire on this one and get this one moving that way too. You can, when I plant this tree, it's going to be on an angle. And when we get to it, I'll show you a little bit more. We kind of see this, this deadwood feature in the trunk. I think I'm going to peel back this, uh, this gin a little bit. It's looking a little bit bulky. So I'm going to reduce it a little bit by grabbing little slivers of it and pulling them down. So I add a little bit of taper and make it less so in your face. And again, more natural looking. So, um, yeah, we really try to, obviously bonsai are man-made. We're inspired by nature. Um, you know, when I'm thinking about this tree, I'm trying to think of making it look like trees that I would see in the high desert, um, maybe California junipers or Utah junipers or something, you know, that grow in really harsh conditions where there's a lot of wind and stuff. And, you know, they get termites and beetles and all this kind of um, stuff that, you know, affects them. But still, they, they continue to survive and continue to grow. Sometimes the whole tree will be dead except for one little strip of, of live, live uh, bark that's feeding, you know, a small portion of foliage further up on the trunk. So, all right, you can't see the front of the tree right now because I kind of have to figure out what we're going to do with this. So, um, now what I'm going to do is wire the rest of the branches and move them around until they please me. Within reason, um, you have a, pretty much a lot of control over what you do with your trees. Obviously, uh, you don't want to take a tree that wants to grow straight upright and make it grow as a cascading tree. That would be a little bit silly. There's a wrong size wire for that. Um, you want to try to 
you know, within reason, keep the trees in their natural growth habit. But, um, you know, you have a lot of artistic uh, leeway in doing that, particularly with junipers. Junipers really lend themselves to um, maybe non-traditional styling better than most other plants. Like, you don't really have to have a... a a defined style with the juniper, you know, they, they grow in such ways where, you know, they, they'll grow all over the place. They'll sprawl out on the ground. They'll grow upright. Uh, you know, they'll grow as cascading trees off the side of a mountain. Um, some of them are tree size. So there's all different sizes and shapes and forms of junipers. So, um, you know, we kind of use those natural shapes and forms as our, inspiration for what we're doing. There we go. So wiring, you want to try to um, weave the wire around the branches so that you don't capture the, the foliage or the needles in the wire. And um, you also need to use a wire that is big enough to do the job. There's nothing worse than spending 20 minutes wiring a tree and then trying to move the branches and you move the branch and it comes back because the wire is not big enough to hold it down. So then you either have to put another wire on it or, you know, take it off and rewire it. So um, I like to make sure that the wire I use is going to be big enough to do the job. And sometimes, um, like in this case, this branch up here is wired to with the same piece of wire as this branch down here, which is much smaller. But um, I need that size wire to move the bigger branch. So that's why I'm using it on this smaller branch. I could have used a smaller size, but then I wouldn't be able to wire that other branch at the same time. Whenever possible, we try to wire two branches with one piece of wire. Um, you know, as it is, especially initially, sometimes these trees look like more like an engineering project than um, something natural. You know, you have a ton of wire on it and bending and twisting things and stuff like that. But it doesn't always stay that way. You know, like I've said before, we're just creating the foundation today. This is just the beginning. Um, this tree will, if taken care of correctly, um, I think really kind of come into its own as a bonsai in about five to 10 years. Then the, uh, the branches will have settled and won't need wire to be held in place. The tree will have been that much time in a pot. And there's a character that a tree takes on when it's in a pot that for a length of period of time that you can't duplicate any other way. We can do all kinds of stuff, you know, to make the trees look old. We can bend and twist them. We can create dead wood, um, all kinds of stuff. But there's that quality of age that happens from a tree being in a pot for a really long time that there's no way around. So a lot of times, Less is more. And, you know, I've made bonsai with just one branch when that was what we had to work with. So, um, you know, it's not like we're trying to recreate a tree with every single twig and branch and um, stuff. First of all, I'm trying to create a tree that's growing in harsh condition. So it's not going to be this full lush tree, no matter what. Um, they just don't get that way when they grow under those kind of conditions. They, it's funny, you know, like um, out in the desert, you'll see the junipers that grow out there. And in June and July, they're just kind of peaked and, and uh, hanging in there because they haven't had any water since the wintertime. But come November or so, um, you know, and it starts raining, they just, like, come to life. They grow a whole new set of roots right at the base of the tree to get as much um, water into their system as they can because they know that after the winter there won't be any more water. 
And they'll basically live on that water that they get in the winter through most of the summer. And what, one of the ways they do that is by going into kind of a semi-dormant state. State, You know, when it gets that really hot, they just can't pull enough water through and transpire it to keep themselves cool. So they just kind of stop growing. Um, somebody wants to know how long you leave the wire on. It's a great question. It all depends. Um, very often with conifers, you'll need to wire them two, sometimes maybe even three times over a period of years to get the branches to stay exactly where you want them. Um, you know, you leave the wire on, they'll kind of set in position You take the wire off. And after a while, just from, you know, wanting to reach up to the light and stuff, branches always want to reach to the sun. They'll start to raise up. So branches that we've brought down will start to go up on their own. So um, it really kind of depends. Typically on this, I'll leave this first set of wires on for anywhere from eight months to a year. And it's going to kind of depend on how the tree is growing. I don't want to leave it on too long because then it will cause scars because the tree will keep expanding and the wire doesn't. So it causes this ugly scar if you leave the wire on too long. And so um, I definitely don't want to leave it on too long. I'd rather take it off and have to rewire it than have the tree scarred up. A little bit of scarring on a relatively young juniper um, may not be the end of the world. You can probably, you know, the tree it will grow out of it if it's a young enough tree. Um, but you really want to try to avoid it if at all possible. So, uh, yes, Penny, this tree is going to be a shoheen. Shoheen is a classification of trees, and they're trees that are eight inches or less. And um, not little baby trees that are eight inches, you know, not little young trees. Generally older trees or trees that look much older that are only eight inches or less. And that's a lot more challenging than creating an 18-inch or 24-inch or bigger tree. Um, with the tree this small, you've only got a couple branches. So the branches are really critical. If you make a mistake and, you know, if I break this branch, then this whole part of the tree is gone. So um, you've got to kind of take that into consideration when you're doing things. And uh, maybe you'll do things twice or a little bit slower just to not to risk something when it's like that. But um, to me, I find it much more challenging to make a good shoheen sized tree than a bigger tree. It's pretty easy to create a big tree. You know, you got a lot more branches and stuff to choose from when you're initially starting. Um, it's easier to make things more proportionate looking than it is with a smaller tree. So, um, you know, but to make a really cool small shoheen size tree um i think is kind of a, a feat so i like the challenge um, and also you know i'm getting older and big trees are just too damn heavy i've got some trees that it takes i've got one tree it takes four people to move um, it probably weighs 250 pounds but i've got you know a bunch of trees that it takes two of us to move to, to work on them and it's a pain in the neck you know if you want to work on the tree you need somebody to help you move it or you kind of have to work on it where it's at and, and work around other trees and stuff like that. Um, pots for bigger trees can get, although can get more expensive, although um, good quality by good artists, shoheen pots can be incredibly expensive. Um, and yeah, you know, pots are an integral part of bonsai. It's not a bonsai without a pot. So, um, you know, the pot has to kind of, um, is a big part of the composition of the tree. Today, I'm not too concerned with that because we're not going to think about putting it in a pot today. But um, when it comes time for potting this tree, probably it'll go into what's called the crescent pot. And it's a pot that's made to look... Um, more like stone than than fine clay 
Um, usually they're kind of shaped like a, a, a crescent or a broken eggshell or something. Uh, and they really lend themselves to trees in these kind of uh, semi-cascade, slanted kind of styles, particularly trees like junipers that are really make the tree look like it's you know growing up in the mountains someplace. Um, but for today, that's not something I'm going to think about. So you know, like I said earlier, timing is really important on a lot of things. You know, we can do a lot of stuff pretty much all year round. You could do light wiring and, and stuff like that pretty much all year round. You can do light trimming pretty much all year round. Heavy bending and, um, you know, major really significant bends and stuff are probably not best done when the tree is actively growing. It's better more like in the dormant or semi-dormant period. Um, so winter time or even sometimes the dead of summer, because as I said earlier, sometimes the trees go semi-dormant in the summertime. Um, but uh, the one thing that is probably the most critical as far as timing goes is repotting, because that's probably the the single biggest, most stressful thing we'll do to our, one of our trees. It is um, usually the first time we work on a tree is the most drastic time ever. Like we'll never have to cut off as much of the foliage. Like probably 90% of the foliage that was on this tree this morning is gone. You know, it went from this to this. But the tree is really healthy, and I know it can withstand that. This is a good time of year to do this. Um, it will respond very well, particularly since we're not doing anything to the roots. And by doing this now and then waiting until next February or March to work on reducing the roots, I give the tree plenty of time to recover from all of this and to um, you know, get healthy again so that it can withstand having 50 or 60% of its roots cut off. I doubt seriously if I would go from this pot into a bonsai pot at one time. I might put it into one that's a little bit big, but I wouldn't put it into its final bonsai pot all at one time. Um, it's possible that you could do that and get away with it, but it's also pretty stressful and pretty iffy on the tree. So I'd rather take my time and you know do it over several seasons then try to do it all in one fell swoop and you know put the tree at risk so and that's always got to be your first consideration is the health of the tree doesn't matter how cool you can make your tree look if um whatever you're doing to your tree is going to kill it or is going to stress the tree so much that it actually starts going backwards instead of forwards. Um, Patrick wants to know how much is a starter beginning bonsai? It could be as little as, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks to hundreds of dollars. It all kind of depends on what you want. As a beginner, um, you probably don't want to go and spend hundreds of dollars on a tree until you're sure that you can keep it alive and that you're going to really appreciate it for what it is. What I typically suggest to people is that they work with two to five gallon nursery stock. So trees that are um, in pots that are this size that we're working on right now. And you know, they're probably this big, but this one is a little bit larger. This one's a five gallon. So the pot's like 12 inches tall, but this is a big bushy tree and there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but yeah, there's all kinds of branches and stuff to work with. The trunk's got some couple of cool directions it can go. So, um, you know, you start out with something like this and you end up with something like this. So you really want to kind of give yourself stuff to work with. If you buy too young of a tree, it just has a trunk and it doesn't really have any branching. So all you can really do is put movement in the trunk. Um, buying a little bit bigger tree like this gives you way more options. Um, it's got a lot more branches to work with. You got more choices to make and you can kind of, um, achieve something that 
looks a little bit more um, mature than you would with, say, you know, a, a little four-inch pot seedling or, um, you know, something like that. Sometimes you can find one-gallon size plants that, uh, you know, are pretty um, – have a lot of branches and stuff and you know might be okay to make proportionate uh, but typically i think two to five gallon is probably the best size to start with and as to what plant um there's a whole slew of things number one make sure it'll grow where you live um i see it all the time you know we're here in southern california and in the winter time in january and february a lot of nurseries will buy bring in all these fancy maples that they bring from Oregon and Washington and their bared root. And you know, it's just a beautiful trunk. And then the leaves come out and they're gorgeous. They're red and purple and green. And they got cut leaves and all kinds of cool stuff. A year later, you know, half the tree is dead or it doesn't because they don't do well here. So make sure you get trees that are going to do well in your climate. Number one, if you're here in LA as a beginner, um, if you want a tree that's going to be green all year, one of the junipers is probably uh, a place to start. Procumbens, not a juniper, is the one, probably the most common tree used for bonsai in this country. It's the one, all those trees you see in the malls or on the um, trucks on the side of the road, those, all those little junipers, most of them are procumbens, not us. And some people kind of like turn their nose up at procumbens, not a juniper because they're so common and um, used on such... Uh, kind of low quality bonsai but um personally i like them um i think that uh for the they give you the biggest bang for your dollar of any other plant you can get and work with um they can they lend themselves to a ton of different styling uh shapes and techniques um, for junipers, they're relatively fast growers. Uh, you know, juniper is basically a pretty slow growing tree, but, um, for cumbas nanas grow pretty quickly for a juniper. Um, they're relatively inexpensive. So you can, f and they're readily available. So you can pretty much find Procumbus Zonis junipers in all 50 states and just about any nursery will have some. Um, they also call them Japanese garden junipers. Um, but you know, it's an excellent juniper for bonsai. For Strata junipers, San Jose junipers, or some others that we use. Um, and there are other ones that are kind of more specialized for bonsai, like, um, Shim, or Shimpaku, uh, which is what this is, or um, Fomina Juniper. But, you know, there's a, a wide variety of them, and they all lend themselves to different styles. Some, like Fomina Junipers, are typically styled as formal upright trees, or straight up and down. They, their growth habit is real straight. So you're not going to see a, a Fomina Juniper with, you know, this kind of movement and curves and stuff in it. They just don't grow that way. Another good tree for beginners here in LA are olives. Olives are, uh, they make awesome bonsai. In fact, originally what I wanted to do for this demonstration was an olive and I would have been able to repot it. Um, olives are one of the few trees that you can repot this time of year. But because of uh, COVID, we had a lot of extra time. So I got to do a lot of work on the trees and not thinking about saving a couple. I did all the work that needed to be done on the olives, so there are none left to, to work on. Um, so now we're going to work on this. And uh, let's see. So it's starting to take a little shape here, um, I think. Comments on anybody? I got to finish the wiring. I still got to move a few more branches put wire on and then i'm going to move the branches around and put them in position and then do a little trimming um then we'll do a little bit more work on the dead work and i'll talk about what will happen what i'll do afterwards and how to take care of this 
And, um, you know, if you have any questions about trees of your own or, um, you know, how to get into bonsai or, or questions along those lines, please type them in the comments and I'll answer those as best as I can. While I'm doing this, sometimes putting wire on a tree, you know, if you've never seen it done, it's kind of interesting to watch for a little while, but it's generally one of the most boring parts of bonsai demonstrations. So um, I appreciate the questions. It gives me something to talk about without having to just kind of think of stuff to make up, which sometimes gets difficult. When you're putting the wire on, um, it kind of helps to plan it out ahead of time because we want the wire to go on as neat as possible. Um, we don't want to have like a bunch of wires crisscrossing each other and uh, going, well, one wire going one way and one wire going another way. Um, it's really kind of ugly. And, you know, bonsai is a very aesthetic art form. Um, and the way things look, even, you know, in stages like this where it's just, you know, the beginning stage of a tree, um, you want to kind of try to make it look as finished as possible. So you, you kind of have to plan out the wire so it all runs the same way. And um, sometimes it's a bit of a challenge. But if you mess up, you can always take it off and do it again. My teacher has had me take it off and do it again hundreds of times. <laughs> so I have a... Uh, you wind up getting a little bit better at wiring when you spend, you know, an hour in a class wiring a tree and then your teacher comes over and looks at it and says, ah, wire is no good. Take it off and do it again. Um, gets expensive too. if You do it too many times. So you kind of can learn quickly that way. Wiring is one of those things though, that um, at first it's really kind of difficult to do. It's like, you know, you're trying to twist this wire around branches that twist and turn and you don't want to uh, get foliage or other branches cut up behind the wire. So you got to be careful and, um, you know, it has to look good. It has to be the right size. So, you know, it's got to be big enough that it's actually going to do what you want it to do. There's nothing more frustrating than putting a branch in position, holding it there, looking at it, letting go of it and watching it start to move. So, um, you really kind of want to do it as best you can. And, you know, wiring is a tool. It's uh, one of our biggest tools as far as giving trees their initial shape. Um, it allows us to do all kinds of stuff. Pull branches up, pull branches down, take branches from the front, bring them to the back. Um, put bends and curves and twists and turns and stuff all because of wire. And wires are actually a relatively new, like um, this century technique. Uh, a lot of times they used to use weights to hang down on branches and stuff. One of the things about wire, it gives you way more control over the shape of the branch and stuff than just the weight or taking a... Um, a piece of wire or string and pulling a branch one way or, or pulling a branch the other way because with the wire on it like this, we get to um, really position things exactly where we want. And I just looked at the clock and so I've been gabbing here for an hour and 10 minutes. I hope people are not bored. So I'm going to do a little bit of final branch placement. And um, we're almost almost there so one thing about um when you're working on a tree like this you kind of want to think about the angle that it's planted at because sometimes you're going to wind up changing the angle so when i plant this tree let's see you guys let me mark the front and then i'll turn it around so you can see it This is perfect. My wife's not home yet, so she won't. I'll get the living room cleaned up, and she won't even know I did this in our living room. <laughs> okay. Um, where that chopstick is is where the front of the tree will be. 
And when I plan it, I'll plan it on a little bit of an angle so that this um, cascading part is actually going down even more. You know, I want to bring this down a little bit. How do you properly prune a juniper? Um, one snip at a time. When you're trimming junipers, you never do this. Never shear a juniper. That leaves, I don't know if you can see them here, all these little cut pieces. And every one of those little cut areas are going to turn brown and get really ugly. So what you do is you take your scissors. It's nice to use scissors like this that are kind of narrow. Get them right to the trunk. And what you do is you want to cut right on the stem just above another branch or shoot. So for that, that was on a stem. Now say I want to reduce the length of a shoot like this. I do the same thing. I take my scissors and I go in right on the stem and make that cut there. And I leave two branches, one on one side, one on the other side. So I always make a cut leaving two branches. What happens now is that one of these branches will continue and make the branch grow longer. The other branch becomes a side branch. And that's how we build up those pads of foliage and stuff that you see so often on, you know, when you see pictures of bonsais where you see, you know, older bonsai trees, they have these, you know, really nice, well-defined pads of foliage. Um, junipers get their strength from their foliage. So you never really want to take off too much foliage. I probably pushed this tree a little bit more than I should have. And probably what's going to happen is that it, it'll be fine. Um, I know I can give it, you know, absolutely perfect aftercare um, and it'll be fine. But probably what will happen is some of the initial new growth will be what is known as juvenile growth. And this here, this is scale foliage. This is, you know, mature adult foliage. And that's the typical way um, the Shimpaku juniper grows. When the tree is stressed or a branch is stressed, it gets this, these kind of like needles here. And you can see they're different. You know, you got these scales like this and needles like this. Um, so probably it'll start pushing some of that mature or immature needle foliage uh, or juvenile foliage for a little while. Um, maybe not, but it might. And if it does, that's fine. I'll, I'll leave the tree sit for, like I said, several months. I'll just water it and fertilize it. And, um, you know, that stuff eventually will change over to more mature pattern of foliage so all i'm doing now is kind of adjusting the proportions and the sizes you kind of want to have the branches so that they're not shading the branches below so when the sun comes down it can get onto all the branches all right so there's, let me see, there we go, this way. So this is what the tree looks like. Um, next year, it'll go into a bonsai pot, and who knows, maybe I'll be able to do this again next year, and we'll do a repotting session with this tree. What food and fertilizer should I give my bonsai tree? Um, there are plenty of fertilizers that you know, are called bonsai fertilizers. But the tree doesn't know that it's a bonsai fertilizer or that it comes from Japan or that it comes from, you know, Hoboken. Um, just use, I like to use mild organic fertilizers. And, you know, I've got a nursery full of trees, so I have um, a lot of trees. So I pretty much use what's cheap. I like to use grow power. It's, it's pretty mild. There's not a lot of nitrogen, so you don't get a whole lot of um, coarse growth. Um, and it also depends on what state the tree is in. If the tree is more refined, you want to use a pretty mild kind of, you know, something just to kind of keep it stable. If it's a young tree and you're trying to grow it and get it to get size before you make it smaller, because that's what we do. We take big trees and make them smaller. Um, you can use uh, a stronger fertilizer, make the tree grow faster. Stronger fertilizers generally equate to coarse growth. So, um, you know, 
be careful about that. If it's a tree that's already in a bonsai pot, um, I like using stuff where the first number, the nitrogen in the fertilizer is less than 10. So I think grow power is um, 654 or something like that. So it's um, nitrogen is the first number. Uh, potassium and um, phosphate are the second two. And the nitrogen is what provides the green growth. And the potassium and the phosphates help uh, with budding and health of the tree and developing roots and stuff. So it's got to be a balance. Uh, if you only have one or two trees, the easiest thing is, is a, a liquid like miracle Grow. You can um, you know, use miracle Grow. It, it's simple. It's relatively inexpensive. It's easy to do. You mix a tablespoon and a gallon of water once a week. You water your tree with that, and you're good to go. Um, but like I said, you know, like some people use this, you know, special fertilizer from Japan that's fifty dollars for a one kilo bag or some crazy number like that. The tree doesn't know that. Um, all it knows is that it needs some iron, you know, some nitrogen and some phosphate and some potassium and a few little micronutrients here and there, which most fertilizers have. So um, what fertilizer doesn't really matter as far as brand or anything. I would just tr try to keep it relatively low in numbers. And um, I personally like organic fertilizers better. They take a little longer to start working, but um, you know, they, uh, they tend to work better. Somebody asked about a front or all sides considered equal for viewing. It's very rare that you have a bonsai that all sides are equal for viewing. Um, almost always a tree has one particular front. Sometimes if you're really lucky, you'll get a couple trees that, you know, you'll get a tree here or there that might have two fronts, um, two potential fronts where the tree really looks good from this side or this side. Those trees you plant in a round pot. Um, but no, most trees definitely have a very specific front. And in this tree, this is the front right here. So when you're looking at this tree on, uh, in its pot on the bonsai shelf, this is the way you'll be looking at it. Okay. Um, well, that was a long time. I hope everybody enjoyed this. Thank you very much for watching and asking questions. Oh, let me answer the water question. Somebody asked how often to water and how much. Watering is probably the single most difficult thing to do because it changes all the time. So you check the tree. If it feels dry, water it. If it feels wet, don't water it. And Tina, if you've been growing the tree in the same soil for 12 years, uh, yeah, you probably should replace the soil. It depends on what kind of tree it is um, to, as to when. And I think there's a link further up in the comments to my nursery. So if you contact me through there, I can help you with that. All right. Thank you very much. And um, good night. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe, and stay sane. Take care. Okay.